Welcome back for finance part two, hours three and four, which is sort of exciting to think about. And thank you very much uh, to Ray and Jared, our guests. And carry on. Okay. Um, We can get, so your staffing is entirely up to you based on what the needs of your lab and your research are. It could be a situation where you do, maybe there's not a lot of what I'm going to call lab work, but there's a lot of data analytics attached to your research. So let's say you ran a bunch of sequencing tests and all that data came back. You maybe don't need a lab tech. You might need a statistician or a data analyst. Um, the thing I would raise on that, raise that comment is you may not need to hire one. The university may have an individual that you can share. Okay, now I'll tell you those individuals, we don't have near enough statisticians for the work that is being done, but there are priorities that are placed on certain types of research, right? And, and employed faculty versus leased faculty versus whatever, versus sadly research or, or excuse me, resident or student research, because they know that the downstream effect of that is, I want to say more valuable, Maybe from a financial standpoint, yes, and from promoting our faculty, maybe that's more important. Um, so make sure that you're visiting with your mentor. Make sure you're visiting with your administrator about the resources that are available so that you don't have to spend $80,000 on a statistician when you, know, you can get it for full time when you can get it for $20,000 because you only need them for a quarter of their time. Okay. Actually, Ray, so the um, <laughs> compliance office has a statistician in-house that doesn't charge. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Is that gonna be the situation long term? Yeah, they've always had, so Alex Hall used to be that role um, for, so for, I don't know, for decades, I think there's been that. Uh, position serves the whole university, but Jack Taylor uh, also can serve. Is there a priority on non SOM schools versus SOM schools? I'm just, maybe, I'm just asking. Maybe he and he's more focused on, um, you know, laboratory research statistics versus clinical statistics. Oh, okay, which means for the clinical Perfect. side, alignment. you would want to go to the clinical research office, mm -hmm. and you may end up. Supporting that. Um, graduate students, in my mind, in the finance guy's mind, cheap labor, <laughs> smart labor, right? Um, but it is still labor that is, in some way, needs to be funded. So it could be funded by your startup package. It could be funded by a grant. Once you have a grant, could be funded by the dean. Could be funded by strategic funds. There are multiple ways that that. And if, if, and if there's a grad student that you guys, that the department, for example, selects a PhD student, brings them in, and it, it just so happens that what their interest is aligns with your interest. Home run. Home run for both. Okay, so keep that in mind as well. It's not, the grad students aren't just for the tenured faculty. They can absolutely be aligned with others, okay? Um, undergraduate federal work study students, how do we have left? Do we have all those in the labs? Mm -hmm. Oh, we do. Right. Half a dozen or maybe eight federal work study students okay. this, this year. Even cheaper labor. Probably not as knowledgeable labor, but definitely people that can be your, I don't know, 
but some are setting up studies and yeah, I mean, some are very interested in Absolutely. this. And we got a you know fortunate match. They aren't just there to which could clean the you know glassware or whatever. Which could also be a great recruitment tool, right, for down the road. Their interest, they see what goes on on the research side of things. Study, and, I wasn't for study, but I did undergraduate research. Okay. If you want a work study student, who would you talk to? Um, just university. You know, there's a student employment office, uh, Sarah DeBooter. Usually we just tell the department. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Tell, do you need? tell Jared or Mary or Gail and say, I'd like a work study. Is there a way to leverage undergraduate students through the Curis program for office research? Okay. Yeah. And it makes sense yeah. that they would be there, but I didn't know if they did that. Mm -hmm. okay. Does everybody know what Curis is? It's, 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 it's basically it's, the undergraduate it's, research it's, program. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so students who are interested in doing biomedical research at uh, Rutter Grads through the office of Curis, basically, uh, they will reach out sometime and say, hey, we have a handful of students with interest in this area that looks like biomedical sciences, and uh, then I'll pass those along to faculty and contact the students. Okay. I have to find some. Yes. Um, so if we hire uh, graduate students with our own funding, do we need to pay for their friends and benefits or? Just for the salary. Yeah, their fringe and benefits would go along with them. A fringe and salary would go together, but if there's a benefit for their tuition or anything like that, mm -hmm. that's all that's all covered by the by the school. If they're a PhD student. But yes, fringe and benefit or salary and fringes would be charged to your Whatever the yeah. grant is, right? Unless it's unless it's dean's office funding, which could be. I was going to say the fringe for a, a a student is really just their health insurance. They don't get the full twenty six or twenty nine percent rate. Yeah, I think health insurance is about thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars a semester for them right now. So again, cheap labor. It, it, it truly is. And some of those kids are really, really that, that sound. They're sharp. Depending on, depending on your heart program. Uh, I, all of our PhD students are paid the same stipend. And uh, as Jerry said, there's the other costs. There's tuition remission costs, which I always call funding. No. But, uh, but the but the real but the real cost uh, rather than French is it's uh, student fees to some extent and, and the health insurance costs. But the difference between a master's and a PhD student, mm -hmm. master's students may vary a little bit more between programs in terms of what they are or much by the students also <clears throat> an opportunity. Uh, to work with you, especially after their first year. And then the HS Maka program also brings in high school students and college students. And the STEM Hat Explorator program. So, summer students. Curious, what? we'll have a new director come to shoot one. Mm -hmm. And I think we probably want to see a new presence and maybe some changes in how they. How they operate, how they try to connect undergrads with the uh, research labs. That's the goal. What about high school students? Just general high school students or volunteers? That's tricky. Yeah, they. That's not a. That's a. That's a tough hill to climb. To be honest with you. Yeah. It's an exposure issue, a lab exposure issue, with liability issue, and they're not real keen about it. There a lot of people. A couple, uh, it's a of high school um, art programs, like there's uh, Zen Habits or 
system oh. and the HS Maca. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, there's so yeah, there's just maybe I can think of oh, like three off the top of my head. I don't know exactly what to call them. <laughs> our our structured programs for creating high school students in these labs. Yeah, it's a liability issue, but outside those programs, it's not something. But you know, just do that You can year. do, but you have a whole bunch of paperwork oh, yeah. and a background check, and they have to be supervised all the time. And it's not just for the fact, you know, but anybody that's going to come in contact with them, there's a background check on them. Mm -hmm. You have to have a research plan in place for them. Same thing with adult volunteers. We really, I don't think there's any way to bring in a volunteer or an adult who says, I want a shadow or something and be in the lab. They just can't do it anymore. And I'll say, Yeah, they're not great. Yeah, it's pretty hard because there's the training aspect, but once they've mastered a task and they're doing it for you, it's something that we'd normally pay somebody to do after that pay them. So it's pretty hard just to bring somebody and say, yeah, they want to hang out in the lab for three months and help out. It's yeah. pretty, pretty difficult. And the last comment on the slide, challenges and opportunities. That's really the reason I wanted to kind of dive into this. And I think HR folks and legal folks, general counsel office touched on this earlier. Um, any of those, any staff that you bring in, it is absolutely to your benefit and the institution's benefit to sit down with those individuals and have a plan for what they're going to do, um, what they're going to be accountable for, responsible for, et cetera. Because if there's not, then there's a tendency to think, well, I can work here and not really have to do a whole lot and still get paid. Um, so it's, it's, I'm just going to say they have to be micromanaged or micro supervised, but there needs to be, if not you, definitely a, a lab manager or somebody that is monitoring them. Uh, having a plan and having a discussion of the expectations at the beginning is absolutely the best thing you can do. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that. Like my guess is the others went through that. Or no? Did they go through? Did HR go through that? I, you know? I wasn't present, but I know. I think we did. No, I don't know. I we, we, had, <laughs> we had the entering mentoring session about uh, compacts with students. With so students. that's similar to staff who's mm -hmm. setting expectations. Mm -hmm. And I think boundaries too, right? Like professional yep. responsibilities not bleeding over into. Expectations that are running errands for the PI or something. Do we have a document that we give to new faculty that kind of walks through that? I think so. I mean, no. There's, some, there's an onboarding that. checklist that HR has. And I think one of the check boxes is have a conversation about expectations, but yeah. not anything more detailed than that, right? Is that what yeah, you've seen? Like that. It's not many. Yeah. It's like a reminder, at least. I mean, it doesn't have to get down into minutia, but as long as they understand, here's what you're going to be doing, here's the expected results uh, of your work, not necessarily the tests that they're running. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think that goes a long way to, it, at some point in time, and, and it, I, I think it also helps, this is the conservative side of me, I actually think having a document that you give to them, that you review with them that says, this is what you'll be doing. This, these are the expectations. And maybe even having a place for them to sign that they've received that document, <laughs> that's probably the best. And, and that is, I think legal would be all over that <laughs> as a positive. Because if expectations aren't met, didn't have that conversation, and it does become a problem, and then HR does get involved, it's, it takes months to get a resolution. Essentially, then you start at, you know, at the start line with them. So you, then you start with expectations yeah. and go from there. So 
as opposed to just being doing the review and said, okay, well, these are the expectations we reviewed with you. You're not meeting them. Now we have to do a performance improvement plan to get you to where we're at. You, you're starting, like Jared said, you're starting from ground zero as opposed to that way to the finish line. So I, I, I can't emphasize that more only because we've had within very recent times, a couple of those happen. Okay. And if you need one more detail on that, I would absolutely invite you to have discussions with Rapenter, with Jared, with HR, I mean, whoever, seriously, it, it, an informed employee running a lab is absolutely what you want to be. If you have any questions, you can ask. Because there's just so much downstream risk and liability, not only for you, but for the entire business. I mean, you don't want to be spending your money Wasting your money on somebody who's not productive doing what you need them to do, right? Mm -hmm. Plenty of time. It'll take a while. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, you're right. Time, because it's not only the money you're, you're paying them, it's also the time that you're investing to <clears throat> visit with legal counsel, to visit with HR down the road, which will be a lot of time to get things. How do I make this right? How do I fix this? No, let's fix it on the front end and on the back. The lost time. Um, yes. Okay, we covered a chunk of these already full time, part time, dedicated, shared. Um, so, dedicated is where you're hiring them dedicated for your lab versus non dedicated, which is basically a, a, could be a shared resource. Be creative with that. I mean, ask other parties. I mean, if you can, if the, if they don't have to be knowledge specific to your research, that you can share. Uh, why not? Absolutely. I mean, it makes total sense to me that you would do that. I've almost always had a, um, a tech who is half time my lab and half time another faculty member's lab. It used to be another faculty in a number of in different department. Now it's somebody in my department, but it's pretty much always worked. It's fun. Fringe benefits, federal benefits are different than the <clears throat> university's benefits. Right now, I think the federal benefits are like 26% they charge to grants, and the universities are almost 30. <laughs> and a huge difference, but a difference. And then, like Jared said, if you've got PhD students in there, it's a big difference. Um, there's also one more. If you get a postdoc, we we do, unless there's a circumstance that dictates otherwise, if you get a first year postdoc, we try to follow NIH rates, uh, salary scales. Technically, they're not applicable to what we're doing here. It, it, in certain circumstances, it is. And in most circumstances, the bench research we're doing, it's not applicable, but we'd like to use that as a, as a scale that we can follow. Um, you can pay more. We like not to be too much less because then it starts to get into an internal equity situation. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's see, you're paying a, may not be your intent. It could be though, you're paying a, a female less than you're paying the male in your lab, or you're paying an individual of a minority less than a non-minority. It, it, that may not be why you did it that way. It may totally be based on capacity, value, et cetera, but it won't be perceived that way. So again, that's another one of those discussions that you have up front with others to make sure that things are okay. Um, I'm not sure at a 90% to 115% of whatever the scale is. That's, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> cost of retaining employees, cost of not retaining employees. So the cost of not retaining employees is the time and effort and lost productivity that you invest in rehiring, refilling that slot 
which is not a small cost if it takes you a long time or if you're looking for a very specific resource. Thus, the reason for providing the information to the, to the individual or discussing what you need a person to do up front so that you don't have to go through that process because it is expensive. Yeah, you don't even have to go. Cost of not developing formal performance plans where I touched. Is there any advice in the room on how to retain employees? Experienced people? How much they could on the and then push them to want to stay. Mm -hmm. You can offer money. Money isn't always the end game, right? If you're if if it's if there's an equity situation between labs and within your lab, should be an issue. However, if somebody is bringing a lot of value to the table, you can, within reason, pay you know, pay them more. I would tell you the big reason a lot of people wants to get comfortable doing something for someone in a certain space at a certain place is because the work environment's nice, the management team is is friendly, not friendly so as to cowtailing to them, but yeah, there's there's good management skills, there's good good people skills, there's conversation, they look out, I mean, it's just a good place to work. They feel safe, they feel like they're valued. That's really, that's why a lot of people will stay. I mean, so the culture part of it and the environment, really critical. Um, I think also, even for like laboratory technicians, I think that the development plan like having a conversation about where do you want to be in five years? Yep. How can I help you? Like maybe that means helping them <clears throat> to the next job somewhere else. But um, a lot of times it means, you know, finding a way to grow the job so that they stay. <laughs> any questions about any of that? Those two slides were probably, in all honesty, probably the two most important slides in the whole thing because the amount of time you can waste by messing up an employment relationship, mm -hmm. it, it is significant. Not just there, to, not just the money you waste on them, but your loss rate. The loss productivity of people, you have a, that one bad apple spoils the whole bunch, it does. It does because they see the resources being, others see the resources being wasted on that person. And they're like, well, why am I not getting that type of attention? Why am I not, well, why am I working so hard when that person's getting paid the same amount I'm getting paid and they're doing half the work I am. So it, it really does pay to be a good manager of your resources. Just want to make one comment on, and I'm sorry if I'm picking no. on you, Ray, but, no. but you mentioned graduate students as cheap labor. That's what made me think. And uh, you know what, while that may be true from a financial perspective of what it would cost to have a technician post uh graduate students I had of some jar if you did pay for one off of a grant though, you gotta keep in mind that a, a student is not an employee. And so many other commitments mm -hmm. to that student in terms of the intellectual development, professional development, development, uh, that they can't be expected to be as productive. So I mean, it really needs something done on a routine basis that's really critical to the advancing your laboratory efforts, getting data for grants, whatever. Like, rather, it's not the best option for ensuring that productivity. Postdoc. Sometimes it's a hard. So I hired um, when uh, I, I opened my the position to hire a technician, and somebody applied for the technician, but she has like a 10 years of experience and like a master. So I hired her as a, a RA. So I gave her, her like. Um, I, I, I think it's, it was okay, like a good uh, salary. 
and I, she said she's going to settle down, her, her family, uh, the husband and kids are here, she just bought the new house, and so I thought that she's going to stay a longer time, so as a new faculty, it is important somebody who hire and stay longer, so I hired her, and you know, even if she has like 10 years of experience, she needs to learn something in my lab, how we do, right? Mm -hmm. So I train her like a, like seven, eight months. And then when I finally can use, you know, work with her, then she told me that she need to leave. She's going to move to Texas. <laughs> oh, no. Her husband, um, <laughs> Want to go to the Texas and then find a new job there because um, it's not very, you know, much opportunities here wow. and then things like that. So, bad luck. I don't know. I, I feel like at the new faculty, one year I spent all my yeah. money, mm -hmm. time, train her. Like, mm -hmm. then I thought it was really. In, in, in this regard, sometimes technicians and graduate students are not very different. I mean, you, you have a graduate student, you invest a lot of time in their training and development. If they get to a productive stage, and then they graduate, and they leave. <laughs> right. And a lot of times a technician is somebody in that, they're usually younger in that transitional stage looking to do what, to what they're going to do for their time. next <clears throat> Yeah. And, and uh, you, you know, maybe you only get a couple of years out of them at best anyhow. Um, because sometimes. we're using like very uh, complicated surger and surgical model. Mm -hmm. So I try and I, I have to give uh, them like a, a certain time, like mm -hmm. at least six or seven months to, you know, get used to. And after that, they want uh -huh. to leave this. But, but a lot of times graduate students are you know, somewhere in between and or excuse me, technicians are somewhere in between and maybe wanting to go long walk to some other professional mm -hmm. school. Best case scenario, I had a technician that became my master's student. And then back to the the technician and then became my right. PhD student <laughs> and the environment left. But right. but that was a great tenure relationship. <laughs> Very productive. Students they like one maybe like second year. First and second year, they are very busy with the coursework and other complaints. I think one of the things that I approach, I, 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 thanks, Brian. Um, uh, so the way that I did that was, I mean, I knew that he might be leaving soon. So he had skills that I don't have, I want to start with my family. And I have skills that he doesn't have. So it's like a mutual relationship that he can have me. And if, even if he leaves, I can't speak from him that I can take forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that works in both ways. So that was my That worked too right. so. If I knew it, I could uh, manage her, like, a different way, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have to, you know, spend, like, train her. Instead, I can just, uh, you know, let her do some kind of technical work. That's But I thought that I can... Uh, be with her longer, so okay, so let's spend time to train her the major work that we are doing today. Yeah, but it's a, it's a very transient environment, right? The exception of like, if we get a real dedicated technician, everyone's gonna be at some point. I, I just have the expectation that with 25% of people that I hire are gonna meet my expectations. Right, and it's just it's just the nature of it. You know, I think that, you know we go in with yeah. high expectations because all people could be disappointed, right? And it's hard to hire people to give you like you can give contact references and they get glowing references, mm -hmm. and the person's turned out to be done. Right? It's it's the nature of the game, and it's part of the process of it just being a place where people are so curious. It, it, yeah, it does make a difference though if you don't put the time into training them and being really clear about what you need and how it should go, you, the odds go way down. I think. I also did discover that you should ask more than one reference or two because they don't always tell you everything. And it makes you waste a lot of hard to get. 
like all the information mm -hmm. even if we have yes. like into three. Yeah. So Dr. North, in your example, your expectations, I think it's good information. It is that mindset, 25%, that, that, that's an interesting mindset. But do you know, is your is it your experience, Dr. Hansen, Dr. Stokup too, or Dr. Steiger, is it your experience that you know within the first two or three months if someone's gonna work out or not? And then you just cut the cord then rather than investing all the time and hoping, thinking that you can salvage that one. Is it better to cut the cord? How do you cut the cord with an employee? That's not so easy. You, know, you can't, if they're not, if you've done the upfront and they're not meeting expectations, then you can. But it's, you have to do the upfront. Otherwise, so they give you- You, you put them on a grant that ends and then they're gone. <laughs> That's what- <laughs> What we did in our HSU, we, we, we would give them for faith when we did. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I love Just the best way. Yeah. So, so I would say a couple of things. One of those, they were coming here for a time. It's like it's a little bit different, but. Grad students and folks, if it's not working out, it's not always the best for you. Mm -hmm. It's also the best for them. And move on to a place where they're going to be successful. Yeah. Right? Every PI has gone through lab different, they do different work, they have different personalities. There's just not going to be good fits. Mm -hmm. And you want that person to go to a place that they're going to succeed. And yeah, you wasted four months of time, but if you can get rid of them, it's better for you. And hopefully, their career just, they can find a place that they think. Yeah. That, that is very, very, very true. It truly is. You just, have, you just have to think about it just in that context. Like, it's not all about keeping your lab. We're all mentors and we're all trying to get people in the right spots. But how to get rid of someone, the, the grant thing's a great idea. Um, another great idea, and I learned this from my brother who worked in California, but the best by story, he said, you can't fire people in California. You make their life miserable. You, you put so oh much work God. on them that they say they want to. They leave by choice and everything. <laughs> HR is recording this. Exactly. <laughs> it's not working out. You know, the bump that you're giving them is really quite everyone should expect, right? Yeah. And that's going to be what, you know, they're, they're, the straw is going to break that camel's back pretty quickly. And it's, they're never going to reach like a, you're not, you're not putting on overly more work than you should expect someone to. But you're putting on more work than they wanted, but it's still at a normal level, right? You have to be you know, cautious. Of each other. Yeah. I didn't realize that research was so much like working in a public accounting for a public accounting firm. I really didn't. Know that. <laughs> I actually have a question about the grant ending. If you do have another grant, yeah, does that work? Or well, like, you, can you just say you, you weren't this grant and this grant to stuff. another project? You've been working on this project. I really need you to do this project. Mm -hmm. So if they're now doing this work, they are going to be funded by that project. And obviously, you don't just have them show up one day and you tell them you don't get any money. But you know, like, I'm trying to get you know new funding to support this, but it looks like. You know, the funding's going to go down, and so it's possible that six months from now, yeah, six months from now the funding may be running out. I just want you to know. And so, even if you have another grant, you are the other people on the other grant, or you're using it to do something. I mean, you're spending it on that implies shaking your head at. I think it's very easy to fire people, even if you do everything right. It's, I just don't think it's, it's not. I mean, it's a. I mean, not that that's I'm something not. I never discovered actually before joining here. I thought it was really easy to fire me. It's a right to work state. It's, it's the. I think to me the hardest thing is that when everything is great, it's great, yeah. and so you don't think about. You know, laying out expectations up front. You don't think about having a, uh, whether it's a, a monthly or a, a quarterly review with your employee where you're actually going to take the time to say what they're doing well, what they're not doing well, where they need to improve, and then document that in HR 
with notes so that so that if things do go south, you've you've got it laid out up front, like we we're talking about, you've got the track record along the way. You don't want to take the time to do that with somebody who's doing well. <clears throat> it's just wasted time and effort. And and you only think about it when you got somebody who isn't doing well and then it's a big burden. A little bit of due diligence as a routine matter for students and employees sets you up when something goes wrong. Yeah. And you don't want you don't want that quarterly or semi-annual or annual review to be the first time that employee is hearing something that's bad. It, it's just it's walking by somebody in the hallway or seeing what's happening in the lab and just stopping them and visiting with them and saying, oh, you know what, instead of doing it this, let's try it this way instead, if you would, please, I, let me help you with that. Those are, that that ongoing communication is so much better than that quarterly, hey, by the way, you're really performing badly, but they've never had that, they've never had that feedback during that quarter. You wanna have that conversation with them real time. And yes, you might have to have it at the end of the quarter, but at least then they should they shouldn't be. Some are, because they don't understand. <laughs> it, it, you want to have that ongoing conversation. Communicate expectations by email. Yeah. So that you have it to show. Oh, that's out. awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And start that as soon as you sniff a problem. Mm -hmm. Laura has Dr. Hansen has to do that with her lab manager all the time. What grant are we putting on? Some waves, I'm in trouble. So, all your cars. Yeah, I know. He does. He knows my tricks. The resident assistant professor is limited to three years. He's been here almost well, three years. <laughs> no, so, we love you, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little bit. I think we talked about this last time a little bit, at least the first couple of general cost principles. I think the first two or first two or first three are pretty. You know, this is yeah, they're reasonable. You, know, you don't want to go out and spend twenty thousand dollars for a hammer, right? You you want I mean the costs need to be reasonable. You're doing your due diligence to get what you need, but get it at a reasonable cost instead of over like overspending for it. Um, allocable costs. You don't have to buy. You can buy a whole box of beakers, but not but charge those if you're not going to need a whole box of beakers for one grant. I'll share them with someone else and allocate the cost or allocate it between grants. Okay, there's multiple ways to, to do that. Um, working with the folks that take care of your purchasing for supplies and, and stuff like that for your labs. Absolutely. They they're aware. As long as you tell them, hey, you know. Can you get me? I don't need a whole box of beakers, but can you order one and I'll split it with so and so and so and so? And they may know that. All you have to do is tell them I want this. And they can say, hey, are you okay with sharing? Um, consistency of cost treatment. When you get to the end of a grant or during an audit of your grant, whoever's auditing that is going to look to make sure that you're treating similar costs the same way. Okay. Uh, so that you're not allocating some costs and not allocating others so that you're, um, oh, you're not ordering a bunch of things for a grant that's about to end that just don't make sense for that grant. I.e. there's no way you can use a hundred of whatever in the next six months. Be able to use 10 or 20, but if you cost a hundred of them and it's fairly expensive to that, no. No, because they know what you're doing is leveraging the cost of that grant to future work. 
I'm going to, the, the last part of that, costs aligned with research grant, grant aims versus costs aligned with pursuit of research aims outside the purview of a research grant. My understanding is that when you're doing research on a specific grant with a specific aim, if you come across something that moves that aim, that's fine. What they don't want you to do is purposely invest funds in identifying alternative aims just so you can go down another path. That's a different grant as opposed to it just being, oh, well, look what I can, the data showed this. Hmm, okay, let's try that instead. It still gets you to an end result that the NIH or whoever would probably like to see, but it's not you purposely pursuing, doing things to purposely generate a different aim. Did I say that right? That's the third right, right. It, if, it's, if it's related to the original research aim, but it's beyond it, but it's closely attached to it, that's fine. Because you're doing more than you expected to. Right. But if you're going to do it, something completely different that's not related to the original grant, that's a no problem. Change scope. So yeah, basically, stuff like, stuff like this happened in my current model one where the first couple of experiments did really kind of let us down a tangential path. But at every reporting period, I always discuss that with you. So that they don't come back to you five years down the road, your grant submission say, why would you study this stuff? But if you're reporting on it, then they can come back and say, this is what that's the balance of the whole point. I'm going to give you two examples, a positive and a negative, because we've had both here recently. So we had an individual that was performing research down the initial grant aim and got funded for that ultimate aim, but also had produce some tangential data that said, oh, this is a whole other research project and this looks very promising. What ended up happening is, keep going down the original aim, You know, and if you've got another one, and you visit with your mentor, with your department chair, ultimately they visit with the dean, and they say, you know what, this really does look good, this could be promising, there could be bridge funding, or we'll get LB692 funding or something that will allow you to move down that simultaneously both, right? But both are still funded, one by grant, one by internal funding, I'll call it. That's great. That's the positive, and we actually had that happen. The other side is you start going down that separate tangent, and you get audited internally or externally, and all of a sudden you're incurring costs that are no longer acceptable to that grant, and you get sideways with the grantor for that grant, and the university, the department, somebody else has to eat those other costs that were no longer fundable by your grant that you said were, and all of a sudden you've made your employer upset or the department you're in, and it may not happen the first time but that sends up red flags that we need to watch this going forward for other things. Now, maybe unintentional, don't make it look intentional about <laughs> that, right? And a one time might be an oops, you get to the second time, and then, and then that's just that's just bad. So I was going to ask, if you have a first grant and you have data, can you use that money? to develop another aim to renew that current grant. So it's going to be aligned, but it's a new aim in the current grant. Is that a discussion with the, pro, with the project officer? Yeah, that's now, like Brian suggested too, that, you know, if this, say, say you're in the grant, you're doing the work you propose, but there's a new opportunity or a, an additional aim or direction. As long as you put that into your progress report, and it kind of gets blessing at NIH. At the time of no. you write it before that it's okay. yeah. well, then, then I think it's okay. But I it's think okay. also that um you know if it's an R1 and you're looking at a competing renewal, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at toward the end of your R01, hopefully you are doing the experiments that set you up for the next one. That's why and I'm asking the question for primary. I mean, it's kind of a 
to a large extent, that's what we have to do, right? You're not gonna. I mean, they're not gonna accept wizard primary data, right? Yeah, that. I mean, you can't do research without some kind of support. Mm -hmm. And we do have internal pilot projects that are great. I mean, money for developing new data for a new grant, but the one grant leads into the next. I don't know what you were going to say, but yeah, I think you know, the POs are always receptive to what you're doing. And you can always talk to them like, hey, I have this sort of area that we're looking up to. You know, is it is it not close enough to relate to the original grant? For the approval of the NIH, they'll, they'll tell you. I think if you kind of explain it to them, they kind of developed out of that brand, it's kind of for the next renewal, maybe it's that's their solution. But you don't want to be funding like, hearing lots of research on, on a grant and then fund like you know, some other cancer project about mm -hmm. that same money. Yeah. Also that mm -hmm. so I think the, the good rule of thumb is that if it would be at the same institute, Probably okay if it's going to be some some sort of research that would be funded by a completely separate institute. That that would be probably something they would kind of fund them. And that is always like talking to the PO and getting that approval. But really, it's how things work. And there's quite a bit of latitude. And then I sure thing is. To get an R01, you have that that percent project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, you know, then, then what do you do with all the time and effort? You do the next thing, right? Yeah. That's <laughs> how it works, yeah. even though nobody's is going to acknowledge that's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> Research is a continuum. It's not like a uh, back, back to build a building, the building building's done, and then you move on to the next contract. Build that building, and then you. <laughs> From an auditor, you know, clients sort of perspective or whatever, if you want to look at it like building buildings, but it's the RIM officers know that. And mm -hmm. then there's no flex. Mm -hmm. I, I, I use the mouse model on an NIH grant that wasn't even the original NIH grant. Mm -hmm. As, like I said, as long as you the company's reports, mm -hmm. for your, that can go this direction. Okay, unallowable costs. So let's talk about the first one a little bit, fundraising development activities. Hmm. Let's say you found something, some whiz bang technique that's gonna be wonderful for, kind of stands a great chance of being something that ultimately ends up being a drug that helps treat cancer. That's fine, keep doing your research. Don't do, don't start, don't, don't go out there and try to raise money to fund, continuously fund your research. If it is truly what you think it is, instead of you incurring the cost, let someone else incur that cost. If it's as good as you think it is, and it's going to end up being something wonderful, my guess is Creighton University would be, and the department, the School of Medicine, whoever, would be more than happy to get um, our fundraising individuals to visit with you, your chair, your mentor, whatever the case is, to talk about what you found. No? Tech transfer, patent it. Go to tech transfer and patent your idea before you publish it, and then you the university can license it but you can be part of those conversations oh, okay yeah don't you incur the cost let somebody else take care of that for you it's basically where i was going to go then but that's i didn't think about that that's exactly where it should be and that could be anything from a technique to a new drug Okay. Alcoholic beverages, the university is very strict on that as well. Entertainment. Entertainment to be a lot of things. Um, 
you know, there could be a lot of things. You're not going to go on, take people on golf trips or boondoggles or have a kegger in the hallway or whatever the case is, right? Um, we might have. We might have to have more more <laughs> I'll charge it to the grand. Yeah. 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 If you're going to have it, charge it to the grand. So you're, you're mainly talking strictly grand funds. Yeah, I am talking about grand funds here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Because the university will allow them. Uh, fine. If you get fined or penalized for something, those fines can't be charged to the grant. They better be charged covered by university funds or some university funds. If you were fined or there's certain penalties, that's probably a, a different discussion. I mean, oh, no, I'm more mean like if you want to do like the team building. Oh, oh. you're indirect. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say on a, a, a limited basis, yeah. What was that? A lab race? You can have a lab for team building activities. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We allow that. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, to a certain extent. Yeah, right? I mean, I, I'm not going to fly. I might have to be away you for a week. I'm just sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> you know, having an idea. I think that would uh, fall uh, under the reasonableness category on the previous slide. Right. Uh, personal use of goods and services, you can't buy stuff that you're using for home use or whatever the case is. Um, employee morale, not on the grant, outside the grant. Um, now, that's not to say that if you're taking, let's say there's a conference that is related to what you're doing with your grant, and you want to take your lab tech and your main lab person to that conference for educational research purposes, et cetera. That's not to say you can't go out and have dinner or something at that conference, okay? No alcohol, <laughs> or you can't charge it to the grant, but you could use other funds for that. And I've literally had people, and I think this is smart, where they're going out and they're gonna have a drink. We'll charge that somewhere else, charge the rest of the meal to the grant. Okay. If it's related to the purpose. Memberships, just because memberships are broad, like you don't you don't charge if you're going to be a member of the American Cancer Society or whatever the case was, Dr. Hansen, you're not charging that to any grants, are you? No. That's part of the university funds. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will say one one thing that happens. I'm looking for an exception. Yeah. Is if you're going to a conference. A lot of times, if you haven't renewed your membership, it'll be that here's the non member fee, here's the member fee. It's cheaper. You can get your membership paid for by essentially registering for the conference as a and still save money. It's still so we're a non money. Yeah. Fee. Yep. We've had, a, we've had a number of those. Yeah. And that's just being shrewd with your money, right? Um, certain travel costs, the biggest item there is, in my opinion, um, upgrades on airlines, flying first class, getting upgraded seats, things like that. You can do it, but you got to find it out. Dash one. You got to check. It. <laughs> and then donations to outside organizations. The, the university will take care of that. None of them grant. Your department might even take care of that. Any questions about any of those? Again, if you if I'm a conservative person. If I would think that there might be a risk, I would ask. It's just safe. And actually, it shows it, 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 it almost it shows you care too, right? Hey, I don't want to be that person that falls into that, you know, get my wrist slapped continuously, continuously. No, I'm asking the questions because I want to be upfront, transparent. Okay. Incentive plans. So there are two incentive plans at the university today. Over time, that's, I was gonna say there's only gonna be one, there will still be two. A, the, so right now, today, the School of Medicine for grants that are in place today is operating under School of Medicine Research Incentive Plan. And that incentive plan includes an allocation of indirects 
And it also includes part two of that plan is a salary bonus plan based on how much of your salary is being funded by a grant or multiple grants. Okay, so um, I'm going to go to the School of Medicine because that's what I'm talking about. So there is an indirect cost recovery rate ten per, when we share it of 10% to the PI, 10% to the department, 80% to the school. Okay, that part of the School of Medicine's plan is phasing out now. So if you got a grant today, it would not fall under the School of Medicine's indirect cost recovery sharing plan. Wait, wait, is that right though? Because the way it was written, it said for grants submitted after July 1. Yeah, so uh, if it's a year. grant that's submitted now or was submitted anytime this fiscal year mm -hmm. and you got an award on it, it falls under the university's indirect cost recovery plan. The only, now, there are some nuances based on the information I'm learning, and it's going to make you sad, to be real honest with you. I, I need to push back on, find out about this. So let's say you get, let's say that Dr. Steyer got submitted a, for a grant in April of last year, got the award for that grant in October of this fiscal year. Okay, same year, but different fiscal year. And it was a five-year grant. All five years of that grant fall under the School of Medicine indirect sharing. I recently heard that COBRI is going to be I, not identified as a five-year grant. It's going to be a year-to-year -year renewable grant. That's the way they're identifying it. So the indirect cost recovery is going to move from here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how do I get that back down? Oh, there we go. I won't keep your hands off. So if I what that says, it's going to move up to here. I'm not of the same opinion. I think it's a five-year grant period. It's not each year is different. I think we got an award that said from A to B over five years. Mm -hmm. So we're going to push back on that. Okay, that's the only grant that they have said. That's how it moves. Yes. Are they justified? I so I don't know. And it's worth a lot of money. Yeah, 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 it's smarter yeah. than normal. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's why I mean. If we need to, yeah, once I get formal confirmation of that from the provost, I, then we need to have a larger discussion that uh, it's it's not that way. But what you said before, Ray, was that both of these plans would still be in operation. That's only through this transitional period. Eventually, bonus. there will only bonus. be, oh, the bonus part of it. Yeah. Okay. This one, that this part. part transitions from here to the university. So any grants that you submit now, today? They're going to fall under this. Okay. So, hey, Ray, so so let's just talk about the university indirect cost recovery plan. Okay. So if you have a federal full indirect cost rate on your NIH grant, as an example, 15% um, of the indirect costs will go back to the PI to a laboratory account. Uh, but I believe they will go back at, or I don't know, what like what frequency so if your funding starts July 1, when will the first deposit of indirect? I thought it was a year-end thing. I can tell you, every every time you spend money, every time an expense hits, yeah. you get credited. Are you so serious? Really? Yeah. Literally? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That, that's how they're doing it. Jared told me this that's the other day. Was like, what? What? Really? That seems really cumbersome. So the account always says zero, but you can spend no, it. No, it will show. It, it just keeps going. It will do it. Yep. But that's the way they do it with all costs. So yeah, they must have that set up in banner to do this automatically. Right. So it's not cumbersome. Exactly. So when payroll hits every month mm -hmm. or by week or whatever, bang, you'll see some money go into your indirect. Yeah. And so it's going to be decreased for every new book. No, 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 no. It's 15%. So it the, these percentages are this 15% to the PI, 
fifteen mm percent -hmm. to the department, forty percent to the school, fifteen percent to I'm going to call it the university, fifteen percent to the provost. See, and, so and my understanding is they're going to use these things to fund always fifteen reinvestment in capital for research, IRB activity, mm -hmm. uh, the cores like the animal quarters if it doesn't break even. Which they're getting closer to that, but it, it'll be reinvested in research type activities. It's my understanding. Okay. So what's the difference between the provost and the university? Well, that's a good question. Father Hendrickson. I do not know that answer. I do not know that answer. Matter of fact, when it first came out, <laughs> this was just 30. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a funny feeling there was a discussion where somebody said, oh, oh my. No, I want my part. Yeah, you can have your part, but I want my part. <laughs> okay. And there's a different distribution for non-federal rates just because the match, the, the, the indirect cost recovery rate for federal grants right now, we're at 47 and a half. Our required minimum for non-federal grants is 30%. So the university wants that still wants their cut. And everybody else gets less. So here's another thing that's going to happen. It's gonna, there's going to be subcontracts. You have a collaborator at another institution that gets an ROI funded, and you have a fifty thousand dollar budget on their grant, an IH grant, or your colleague down the hall at Creighton gets an ROI, and you are a collaborator on that grant. Do you want to speak to those two? So my understanding are the indirects follow the PI or co-PI. So if it's a subcontract with a collaborator at another institution, then the indirects would be divided in the same way for the Creighton subcontract PI. So if they're a PI, if they're identified as a PI, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, so I mean, sending it to another institution. No. No, we would retain our retain the six. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd still be the, so, the first, the federal IRC. So we we just have a piece of someone else's grant oh, here. Grant here. Yes. And then if it's and then if your collaborator is the PI at Creighton, you wouldn't get any interact costs. I think so. No, because the other person would be the PI. Correct. But you might get could be co-PIs. Co-PIs work differently if there's co-PIs. MPI. What's that? Uh, multiple multi PI. Oh, an MPI. I mean, so if it's 50-50 or 25-25-25-25, that's the way they would split. Still the same percentage, just split across two, three, four, however many words. Okay. So here's why I said there's two parts. There's ultimately two in the future. The university. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it what it is. The university said no bonus. Period. The School of Medicine, probably three or four of us, really went back to the university, hit hard, said no, 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 no. You don't understand how we're competing or what we're competing against for other institutions. They get there's a bonus program at other institutions, we absolutely have to have a bonus program here. So what the university committed to after a significant number of discussions, they said, fine, Dean, out of your 40%, if you wanna use some of that to fund a bonus program, you can use it for that. It needs to be reasonable. By reasonable, you need to show us that we're not paying out 40% versus UNMC or University of Iowa or Wash U and they're at, everybody else is at 5%. And we're not, and, and what they tried, the reason they wanted that is they didn't want those special deals out there going to certain faculty versus others. They want it to be as uniform as possible. Okay. So, this goes away, actually, 
that has gone away today for any new grants. This is still in place and it becomes a use, this and this. And Dana said, I'm gonna share that. Okay, now, you look at this and you say, well, this is wonderful. I get all of this money in my account. Because you do, it all goes to an account under your name that you are the PI for. You have access to it. Now, you still have to spend it for research-related activities, et cetera, right? But there, it's a little looser than a federal grant or any kind of grant. However, there are a number, I just, I, I, this is kind of the expectations part. This, when it was, when under this situation where it was, where it's 80% or before this went into place where the dean got everything, the dean was funding some, a significant amount of things. He was funding all subsidies to all course. He was funding, I don't know, 20 PhDs. That's eh, probably, might be, I'm going to say closer to 25 PhD students across the three departments. He was funding 100% of large equipment purchases. So, and there's a list I could go down. There's a number of things. If he's no longer getting 100% of that, school isn't, and it's 80%, well, now there's an expectation. Maybe there's some participation by these other people in some of those things. I think we have to charge a little bit more for the course so they don't lose as much money. It's not as much of a subsidy. Okay? When it goes from 80 to 40%, it's even more so. Now, it's not a situation where the dean's going to be egregious and just say, well, okay, well, now I'm only going to I'm only going to fund 40% of everything I funded in the past. If you want a PhD student, that's great, but you're going to fund 60% of that. Uh, there are certain things he's going to continue to fund just because it's the right thing to do for the promotion of research. There are things he can't fund because now the pool is much smaller. So for those things that are in the best interest of the institution, the school, sorry, the School of Medicine and research in general, he's gonna to continue to fund those. But now, instead of him funding 100% of let's say bridge funding, nope. Now it's going to be a situation where the first place for that PI who's asking for bridge funding is to say, this is really important to me. I have money in my account, but I can't fund 100% of it. It's all right. Then you have a discussion with your chair. because the department's getting funds. If you and your chair are willing to invest in it, the dean's going to say, you know what? That's probably worth investing in. If you aren't willing to invest because you don't have money. Well, let's, let's, take, let's take a different way. If you aren't willing to invest and you do have money, <laughs> the dean's probably looking at that and going, mm, yeah, okay, if you're not willing to do it, why would I do it? So I don't think right. we've even really gotten to this with these brand new faculty. Yeah, you know, we haven't. I just have, who have startup money, but we do have a bridge funds guidelines oh. that I, I so um, the salary salvage is a portion of the salary that the faculty member is covering on their grant. Correct. So it's not really a cost to the school, except, right, because it's a right. portion of it's what cost of the grant. funding. Yep. It's, so oh, I, I, well, but it's savings. Yeah, there's salary savings that yes. we're getting. So, so the You're minimum right. expectation is that you're funding 25% of your salary after the first three years on your grants. Anything above that is above expectations. So once you get above that 25% rate, the share kicks in, okay? But the, but the School of Medicine is already better off because of the 25%. Yeah, so the indirect, so the salary salvage bonus doesn't cost it it's it's paying back a fraction yeah it's a it's a it, I, you know i'm going to call it what it is it's a thank you for being productive it's a thank you for generating research it, it is it's still just a portion of the salary that would have been given out that is correct anyway yeah. that is correct so yeah so so it's not like that costs us anything 
it's just part of what's coming in from the person's grant. And, and you have two things you can do with that. You can take that bonus, buy yourself a new car. You take it as salary. Or you can invest it back in your research. You can put it into your research fund. Now, once it goes into that research fund, you can no longer take it as salary. That's this little IRS thing called the Deferred Compensation Plan, which they don't like. You can have them. It has to be a very formal plan the university has. Um, so you want to make that decision with, an, with an, a known end to it, right? You want a piece of equipment and, oh, yeah, that piece of equipment that I'm going to buy is going to allow me to do all kinds of wonderful things. And it's worth, I'm going to make more money down the road through the bonus plan if I reinvest this. And there's a risk that if I don't reinvest myself, that I won't get it. You want to have those conversations before you put it in your fund, to be real honest with you. I'm just going to leave it at that. Is that a worksheet? What's that? Is that a spreadsheet and worksheet for that? Is there a worksheet for that? Uh, yeah, the, the uh, administrators have a worksheet for that. Absolutely. Now, it's now the bonus stays the same. The indirect cost share formulas that are built into that spreadsheet are going to change. And I need to, matter of fact, we just talked about that Wednesday, yesterday. And I need to, I need to move that. I need to set up two sets of formulas, one for the continuing research that's happening in place today and funded, and one that's new starting today. Yeah. I think that would be like sort of, yeah, just because it's just a flat. It would just be the flat thing, 50%. Correct. Correct. Yeah. That I have yeah. 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 So, yeah. That's correct. Um, isn't, isn't there a document out there, too, that some somewhere that breaks down the salary salvage, if you have 25 to 30% on your grant, you get that much? <laughs> So yeah. there, I, I brought Doc quote that just so you know, there's documents. I'm, I'm more than happy to share these. Matter of fact, I think this one is on the Provost website. If not the Provost website, I think it's under the institutional officers website. So that's the university plan they're talking about. Yeah, there. yes, it, it is pretty. Actually, it's a one-page document with FAQs on it, which I find interesting that theirs is a one-page document and ours is a seven page document. I, I, I don't really understand that because this document that the School of Medicine put together was based on a lot of research from a lot from a lot of peer institutions. So I don't know. Ray, I was told when I asked why, Ray, keep it simple. Okay. Love our page, right? That's what we're gonna do. Hi. There's just there's a lot of there's a lot of potential loopholes in here, let's just put it that way. Whereas we tried to close as many of those as possible with definitions here. And when I asked for these definitions on here, to be transferred over here for the safety of the university. Um, I just hold up. So Ray, you said, were you just being rhetorical when you said that I'm gonna be unhappy about something about Cobra? Particularly you're talking about this one, what I was saying, it, it's this, it's the one year thing versus the five year thing. I think it's, I think it's too. I think mm -hmm. you, you want it to be this way because we've got more control over, we have control of all the school of medicine has control of all the money. The of okay. Now it's only 10% to you or to Cobra and 10% to the department. Mm -hmm. But this 80% to the school, that's a lot of money that the dean's gonna look at that and say, yeah, okay, I still, I'm still gonna reinvest in Cobra. Whereas now, yeah, you're getting more, the department's getting more, the dean's getting a lot less, and 30% is going up to somebody who may who may sit back and say, Well, I'm already investing in Cobra. I'm paying for 75% of this or 25% of the salaries that are going to the School of Medicine. It's 30%. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, less. Yeah, you're right. So I think this is I think this is the better deal for That's the better for Cobra. I get that. Right. 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 I wasn't quite sure yeah. where, where you were. Yeah. In my opinion, it's better. Now, 
if if there's some reinvestment situation on Cobury funds that we can negotiate where that 30 still goes, it's 15, 15, 70 for Cobury, that's great. Mm -hmm. Let's do that, right? I don't think they're gonna budge on it, but well, that's not something that we'll have to discuss because we're, you know, the intent is to go up for our competing renewal this time next yep. year. Yep. So, you know, we have to redo all those ladders and we don't really want them to be very different. There'll be some minor tweaks, but uh, they shouldn't be very different from what we already have at this moment. And maybe that is part of the letters. Yeah. Well, is that true. that. 15 or 30 percent that's going to the university in the provo or the provost mm -hmm. one or both is reinvested in the cobra programs okay so jared and i will come and talk with yeah you we need to have a discussion thing. with the dean because the dean's going to end up having that discussion with the provost and yeah. okay so we'll ultimately we'll the president and check with you and then we'll we'll, we'll introduce them to the dean because we need to do it now not this time next year yeah Understand. Can you talk to me about it too, Peter? Oh, absolutely. I'm so sorry. Yeah. You have about 10 minutes left. I don't know how many slides you have. Just one. I, no, I think that was it. Isn't that it? Oh, sorry. Okay. Just want to make it's sure. Still, we get this is last. We've already, and I think we've already talked. So shared shared indirect funds are deposited into a, your own account. If there's $100,000 there, there's $100,000 there. And that's part of it. What the provost and the dean don't want you to do is build all, just keep building up this fund. They want to see that you're actively investing it into your research. Uh, bonus paid directly or deferred. We talked about that in that PI fund. Uh, bridge bridge funding. Talked about that a little bit. There's a separate process specifically set up for the requests of bridge funds. And the reason there was a process set up for it is so that it doesn't, it's more than one person making the decision. And i.e., well, I like so and so, so I'm going to give them grant funds. Oh, I don't like so and so, I'm not going to give them or bridge funds. Um, no, there's there's more, more than one party involved in that discussion. Okay. Um, funds cannot be distributed as PI. Yeah, so I talked about that, right? You can't put money into your fund by deferring your bonus instead of taking it as compensation, and then later say, "Oh, I want that." Once it's there, it's there. It's kind of like a retirement plan or all I'm speaking. Uh, there's penalties if you try to withdraw it. <laughs> like a hundred percent penalty. <laughs> can you pay for, for, for lap stuff? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can use it for lap stuff. Absolutely. That's what it's for. Absolutely, that's what it's for. And then use expectations that that's just the question right there. You could use that if, if you have hmm, we like to follow federal grant restrictions on that. But if you wanted to use that to your comment earlier to have a morale booster party, let's say you got another grant and you wanted to celebrate that, you can't put the celebration costs into your grant. You can put the celebration costs into your PI directed fund as long as the celebration is reasonable. Travel, computers, equipment, all kinds of stuff. Anything that's a valid anything that's close to research related. Yeah. But it can't be uh it can be. That, that, that. Yeah, definitely. Not yourself. Yeah. Okay. And and this account, this this PI specific fund that we have set up, so it's no different than your grant fund that is set up. Okay. Uh, you've got your own fund. It's attached to your six-digit org number, so it is yours. The only time that goes away is when you leave. Now, it doesn't go with you. It stays with the institution, and it ends up actually being reinvested back in your department. It's where it ends up going. Or if the department goes away, then it ends up getting reimbursed, or it ends up getting going into the School of Medicine's fund, Dean's fund. He has a separate fund that his goes into. So you can keep it without using it for years, just yep. for rainy day. Yep. And and I, yeah. you know, I know reinvest in the research, but also it makes a lot of sense to accumulate some for that rainy day. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, that's what your we, NIH grant. 
and you build that up for five years. So in yeah. case the renewal doesn't go well, mm -hmm. castle kind of fall back on yep. whatever. Yep, we we want people to not spend it all out every year. That's right? correct. Absolutely. Absolutely, we to don't have that, that flexibility for whatever. And that avoid to have to bridge. Yes. To have it, it, I, I think it's important on that bridge fund thing. There's not an expectation that you're, let's say you have $100,000 in that fund and you want a $100,000, a $100,000 bridge fund. Can they get $100,000? Yeah. There's not an expectation for you to spend the entire $100,000 on your own bridge fund. If you say, okay, Dr. Soka, I'll put 25, you put in 25, can we ask the dean for 50? Or maybe I'll put in 30, 33, you put in 33 and we'll ask the dean for a third. It, it's, it's all, it, it, I guess yeah. my question would be though, to that person uh, is like, why? Why do you want to save it back, right? Why do you want to save I mean, it why are, back? So why, why are you, are you only that willing to use? Oh, back. yeah, that's part of the whole discussion. Absolutely, that's yeah. part of the whole so discussion. So I, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. just like, well, I don't want to, or <laughs> I mean, like, if there's some future <laughs> use that's planned, but otherwise, I guess I would have an expectation that those funds would be used to pay the research expenses first, unless there's some reason. I don't know. I might, I might look at it differently. I mean, the the cost allocation was 15, 15, 30. So, you know, for the last five years of a five year NIH grant, you know, the department was getting paid, the PI was getting paid, the school was getting paid. And so when it comes time for needing bridge funds, why not have the same sort of cost allocation to support the bridge funds? Well, the school is also supporting a lot of things yeah. with those interacts. They're not just yeah, they're accumulating. Not accumulating them as well. um, I think those are all things that will be taken into consideration. I, I think the dean, based on discussions I've had with him, and he's had with me, well, Ray, what should I ask for? And I said, well, it's, it depends on the situation. It really is dependent on the situation. But at the end of the day, if you're willing to make an investment in yourself with your portion, some of your funds, and the chair is willing to say, yeah, you know what? This is a good investment. It's going to be hard, hard pressed for the dean to say, mm -mm, ain't happening. Well, except it goes to me. And then the conversation <laughs> so there is a recommendation person that, that you have to be nice to. So if you have chocolate, you want to spend, send it to Dr. Hans. <laughs> yes. I don't well, know. The other side of it is that if, if you have money in your own PI discretionary fund, kind of like a golden handcuff, because, you know, you leave. You can't take it with you. Yeah, you so, so you know, if you're thinking of leaving, you're going to have to spend it, and that's a bit of a red flag for the yes. administration because they're going to start thinking, "Why right, they've got a grant and they're spending out their discretionary fund? What, what's happening?" Mm -hmm. So it's just another way of looking at the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, know, I by no means, man, the dean's that when I say the dean, the dean's not making the decision in a black box. He's really going to look. There's, there's a young lady right over there that he's going to look to and say, what do you think? He is. <laughs> oh, also, if you, like, squander your fund, you're young. could they look at that and be a like, oh, you have nothing with left. substantial so. expertise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, yeah, that's a more appropriate Something. way to put it. <laughs> Love you, Ray. So, with regard to the recovery, though, um, and these and these uh, indirect recoveries, so people that uh, have like a project uh, RPL on, on the recovery, they don't get any indirect. Yeah. So that's going to that's all part of recovery. And what when when there's indirects related to or generated from recovery. It goes into, it's not going to Dr. Steiger, even though he's the PI of COVID. 
it's going to it's going to a fund or funds actually that you're that are specifically used to reinvest in cobra activities now it could go back to an individual rpl that is working with that's funded by cobra for equipment or whatever the case is but there's a committee that makes those decisions about those expenditures and how things are done I mean, it is so the right now the 10 percent that would go to the pi is really going someplace else and the cobra i'm pretty sure that's the case i think it's going into the two four fund it goes now it goes in the end goes right now it's going at the end of the year we we don't we're not as sophisticated as the university i think that's wonderful that they're doing it that way so it doesn't go to the project later no yeah. actually there's some i mean i don't know if i can mention that for the renewal of the cover but there are some counter incentive to get the rpl for example if you do have an ih grant and you take the rpl you have no way to get, for example, salary incentive because the RPL is already 75%. So even if you have any other grant, you will never well, you be could able do 25%. To... You could get up to 25%. Yeah, you're going to use 25% of your grant, but then you're not reaching the 30% to get the 5 first percent of no, you need incentive. 25%. It, it, it can't because you have to have a certain amount of 5% of administrative time. You can't be 100% funded by grant, so you can't. So can't if 75% of RPL, 5% of uh, administrative, you will never reach 25%. Yeah. I had this discussion. Well, maybe we need to rethink that, but that's hard to set up a racial Okay. And then once you get a grant, I mean, once you get a grant on, and you're under COBRI, then, I mean, you're no longer... An RPL under COVID, yeah. you're so, off. And then immediately it shifts over and you start getting money to your fund. So it's actually depend the grant. So R21 and R21 ECR are not restrictive. So you can have both, like Lita right now has yes. R21, R21 uh, RPL, and he's stuck on his person. So he have a problem when he tried to actually do collaboration with other PI because he's already reaching the max of it's because 75 is really big. No. So I don't know if that's something in the future well, that can maybe be unusual effect. I mean, most, most RPLs are not have this much extra support besides the RPL. Yeah. Most, most, most emerging investigators um, that are an, R, an RPL, it's their, that's their only grant support. Hmm. They rarely have additional grant support. Why can't that 75% be negotiated down? Mm -hmm. It can be, but it's a case by case basis. But we, I mean, the absolute minimum that's allowed by NIGMS is fifty percent. Mm -hmm. But, so but we want we want the RPLs to not be distracted by teaching or other grants, so they get that ROI. So that's why we we want them to be on that effort seventy five percent. You know, we are thinking about changing the salary structure a little bit. This is one of the conversations I want to have with you and Laura about changing that. I think we talked about this yeah. a bit in the admin call advisory yeah. meeting. But um but we still want the the RPLs to still have 75% effort to, to focus on getting that R01 in so that they can become Okay, good convers good points, good conversation for uh, future as we think about the renewal and I think you know really good points all together. I think this was great and we made it to the end which is awesome. We're only three minutes late. So if, if I could leave you with two things, two takeaways from the financial section, ask questions. You've got lots of resources. Ask questions. No one's I, I doubt someone's gonna look at you and go, huh? They're going to respond to your questions. I, I, I got to believe it just based on the people that I work with. I in the right? the second well, one, we don't know. <laughs> the second one is please set expectations up front for those employees. That, that is by far the most costly mistake you can make, is not doing that. 
with those individuals and then monitoring 